Welcome, Ephraim. And we're going to get going again this morning with what we're, we're going to be talking about here, and that is on envy and emulation. And let's go to prayer, and let's open this thing up as we look at what envy and emulation truly is. Father God, we come before you, and we thank you, Father, for what you're bringing forth for your people. We thank you for what you're driving out from your people, and we thank you for what you're preparing your people for and the things to come to the face of this earth. And right now we take authority over everything, every form of evil that would try to assert itself, to come against, to hinder, to blind us after we've been unblinded, to plug our ears when we've already been able to hear. We take authority over that. You don't have any right to God's people. And right now we push forth the anointing we push forth the anointing, God's anointing, to minister to His people. And we ask these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. So like I said, we're going to talk about envy. And of course, if you'd like to pull out your dictionary, as I always do, and we can flip over to the word envy, and we're going to just look a, take a little quick brief look on what envy truly is. So envy is a feeling of discontent or covetous, covetousness, with regard to another's advantages, successes or possessions, or anything else that they've got, anything else that they've gained, anything else that they've worked to, anything that they've achieved. That's what envy is about. It's in regards to another's. Now, when you look at emulation, emulation is an effort or desire to equal or to excel others. And those others could be people, deities. It could be other ministers. Emulation can be in a number of different areas. But people and believers, and you're going to see me start splitting hairs this morning, because people, all people aren't believers. And not all believers are people. We're spirit being. We're either going to emulate light, or we're going to emulate darkness. Emulate light or darkness. And you're not going to hear me say much more about emulate throughout the course of the sermon. I may bring it up one more time. But it is salt and pepper across the whole thing. And you'll see where these people were either emulating light or they were emulating darkness. And are we allowed to emulate light? We're supposed to emulate light. We're supposed to try to be like God. We're supposed to be godly. We're supposed to have the mind of Christ. And we have to emulate that and set the bar that high. But the problem with envying that sometimes will be that we lower the bar and we start to quit and we say, I'm never going to get there. And that's part of the emulation process. That's part of the envy process that you give up. So let's look at 1 Corinthians 12, 31. You don't have to flip there. It's one verse. And we're going to look at good envy. But covet earnestly, as I just gave in the definition of envy, covet earnestly the best gifts and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. Let me read that with uh, the word envy in there. But envy earnestly the best gifts. The gifts of the Father. The things that the Father has given. The things that the Father has given to His people. You know, envy those things. Strive after them. And He will show you a more excellent way. Now, like in Deuteronomy 28, you know, it's the first 15 verses as uh, do this and here's the blessings. And the rest of it goes on to chapter to the end of the chapter, which is up to 68, I believe it is. And it's all about the things of darkness. And this is where we're going to flip over and we're going to start looking at evil envy. Let's go to Galatians 5.19. Galatians 5.19. Matthew, could you bring me that cup behind you, please? That silver cup? Galatians 5.19. And it is perfectly evident what the old nature does as it expresses itself in sexual immorality, thank you very much, impurity and indecency, involvement with the occult and with drugs, infuting, fighting, becoming jealous and getting angry, and selfish ambition, factionalism, intrigue, and envy, there it is, and drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you now, as I have warned you before, those who Dutch the do such things, will have no share in the kingdom of God. So right here, we're going to look at this one aspect of all this, and it's quite the company that envy keeps here, isn't it? But we're going to focus on this envy, but look at the company that goes with it. 
All these things, and the end result is we'll have no share in the kingdom of God. So do we have to watch out for envy within our lives? Yes. But am I really going to focus on this being part of us and what we've got to go through and what we've got to drive out of our lives? That's part of it. Because the other aspect of it is the envy that's going to be coming towards God's kids. And we're going to walk through scriptural circumstances that have happened and we're going to look at what happens when others envy as well. Because envy started all the way back in the Garden of Eden. And envy is still going on even this day. And we're going to prove it to you scripturally. But with envy, what is envy? We get into all these things here, the sexual immorality, impurity, indecency, jealousy, all these things. They're all acts of the flesh. And that's where envy lies. It starts off on the outside, and when you allow it to get on the inside, you're in real trouble. Because what envy is, is envy is a reaction. Envy is a reaction to a heart issue that you've got. Envy is a reaction to a heart issue. And what envy is, it's a familiar spirit. Envy is a familiar spirit and it expresses itself through that fleshly vessel that it resides in. It's a familiar spirit. You see, the problem with envy, though, is envy is, is small. We can all take care of the familiar spirit of envy. The problem is envy has got a big family. Envy's got big brothers that are strong. And when you take care of envy in your life, if you take care of envy on the outside, if people don't take care of envy in their life, you're going to have those big brothers coming at you, or something will rise up inside of you that they have gone out and brought back in. And those are the things that we have to look at. Now, I'm going to try and stay within the patriarchal order today to show you how envy has constantly influenced God's people. We look at Abraham. I'm going to get into some more scripture later, but I'm going to give you a quick list here. I'd probably write it down every other line because I'm not going to give them all to you right now. Abraham battled envy. You see, you look at the point in time where they envied and Abraham had fear that they were going to envy his wife and they were going to kill him for it. It forced him to lie. It drove him to lie, to try and self-preserve himself. And it was all because of the fact, all because of the fact they envied his wife. And then you get the patriarchal order, Isaac. The same thing, the identical thing happened to him. He ended up lying, but it was the envy of the people that he saw coming at him that forced him to do something contrary to God's word. You get into Jacob. Jacob battled envy throughout his family. And through Jacob, you go down to Joseph, and Joseph battled envy that was up towards himself. And you go down the, the, the heritage line and you get into David. David had to, to battle envy. And of course, we're going to talk about David. I'm preaching. And then after David, you go down the lineage, down a few more generations, and you get into Jesus Christ and how Jesus Christ himself had to battle envy. And we're going to look at all these things, but let's go to 1 Timothy 6.3. 1 Timothy 6.3 and 4. But if anyone teaches otherwise and does not assent to the sound and wholesome message of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and the teaching which is in agreement with godliness, he is puffed up with pride and stupefied with conceit, woefully ignorant. He's a morbid foundness for controversy and disputes and strife about words, which result and produce envy and jealousy. You see here where envy and jealousy are separated. Quarrels and dissensions, abuse, insult, slander, and the base suspicions. But you see, we've read twice now where envy and jealousy are separated, and they're apart from each other because they're absolutely separate. And here's where they're separate, but they are so closely re related. Anybody ever see the primary color wheel where you have the red, yellow, green, you know, red, yellow, what's the other one, whatever. And they overlap, and you get a different color. And that's what happens with envy and jealousy. Sometimes they're so closely related that they will overlap, and we don't know what we're dealing with. Because what envy is, envy is a reaction to lacking something that another person possesses. Something that somebody else possesses. 
And jealousy is a reaction to fear. It's a fear of losing something that we possess. And I'm going to give you scriptural references even for these so that we can really identify what envy is. I'm not going to focus on, on the jealousy aspect of it, but in order to shave away, we were talking about butchering yesterday and running things through the bandsaw and getting to that, that tenderloin and the best part of it. It doesn't mean that the rest of the meat is no good. It just means that that's a separate meal. And the teaching on jealousy is a separate meal than what we're, we I really want to focus on and what we're going to focus on here today, which is envy. You see, when you get into the spirit of envy, and ex just explain what it is, but it could go as simple as to envy in somebody's car. But at the same time, it can also go all the way up where the nations are envied. Your walk is envied. People have died over envy. But envy in some of its brothers, we've talked about strife already. Envy will bring in strife. What's strife? Disagreements, bitterness between people, all because of envy. It'll also bring in a spirit of selfish ambitions where you just want to do what you want to do and that's it. It doesn't matter what anybody else says. You're just going to do this and do this and do this just like that. No counsel. No talking to other people. No running things past other guys or girls or your wife or your spouse. Envy will do that. And envy will absolutely get right back into a marriage. And I'm going to show you at the end how that can happen. It'll lead to rivalry. Rivalry. All these things are spirits. They're not fruits. They're spirits. I, re I read there in Galatians. And I stopped just before it went into the fruit of the Spirit. Those are contrary to the fruit of the Spirit. All these things. And envy is contrary to the fruit of the Spirit. But it will bring all these things in and all these problems within your life. It will bring in things like that are sins that are passed down. I'm going to show you through the Scriptures today how things went. We've already looked at it through the patriarchal order a little bit here already. How they had some envy and envy was against them. Both circumstances I'm going to show. We're going to look at it through the Scriptures and the eyes of the ultimate authority. We can see and we're going to look at how it'll get into religion and our walk and how it can destroy our walk. We're going to look at rejection and how envy is tied into rejection. Because you'll reject the Word of God if you get to a certain point and you're envying something and envying somebody else's walk or somebody else is envying your walk so much that they say, I cannot achieve that. And they will reject themselves even though God Almighty has not rejected it. They will back away and they will just cocoon and they will reject the Word of God because they think that they can't achieve it. It'll get into seduction, a spirit of seduction. All these things are tied up. You see, what is seduction? Seduction is getting people to do other things and getting people into trouble, getting people into troubled spots, and that's where envy will lead one of the brothers of envy. And when you put it all together, it'll lead you to an absolute place in your mind and a place in your walk. And when the big, big brother comes in, a schizophrenic spirit. A schizophrenic spirit. I'm going to sum that up just as like that. Schizophrenic spirit. But if you look at somebody like, like Saul and what went on with Saul, you can see how he was completely out of his mind. He had lost it because of a familiar spirit that he initially didn't take care of. He allowed it to come in, and it brought in brother after brother after brother, spirit after spirit after spirit. So where can envy absolutely drive you? Let's go to Genesis 4.1, and we're going to start off close to the beginning two steps away from the beginning. Genesis 4.1. And there was a man sitting in his briefs one day. No, sorry, wrong. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she became pregnant and bore Cain. 
And she said, I have gone, gotten and gained a man with the help of the Lord. And next she gave birth to his brother Abel, and Abel was, Abel, Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. We've talked about fruit a little bit already. And Abel brought the firstborn of his flock and the fat portions. And the Lord had respect and regard, two key things there, and the Lord had respect and regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no respect. And so there was something going on there. So Cain was exceedingly angry and indignant, and he looked sad and depressed. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why do you look sad and depressed and dejected? If you do well, you might want to underline this, Genesis 4, 7, if you do well, Will you not be accepted? So obviously he wasn't doing too well at that point in time. And if you do not do well, sin crouches at your door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. And Cain said to his brother, let us go out in the field. And while they were there in the field, Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. And the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? And he said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Again, dejected, depressed, angry, indignant. And here he is. Am I my brother's keeper? Is that a kind of an attitude? It was an attitude of Cain's heart. Something wasn't right with Cain. Genesis 4.10, And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed by reason of the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's shed blood from your hand. Now I want to look at this from a viewpoint. There's many viewpoints on this, many lessons that can be pulled out of this. You see, God expects you to partake of the fruit that his earth produces. He expects you to take part of the fruit of his bounty that he has provided for his people, the fruit of the Spirit. But the thing is, when it gets into the fruit, which he didn't receive, but he accepted the sacrifice, the thing is, what are you willing to sacrifice to get to the fruit of the Father? And you have got to be willing to sacrifice any type of envy, any type of jealousy, all these things that we've talked about in order to achieve the things that God has set aside for his people. He has set aside a table in the wilderness and we're going to talk a little bit about the wilderness in a little bit, maybe. But what are you willing to sacrifice? What are we willing to sacrifice in order to get it? Just a little bit and still hang on to some of these other junk that's around us? Some of these things, these, the, 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 it talked about the, the drugs, it talked about the sexual immorality, all these things that go on in society and are so prevalent to it. Are we willing to get rid of those things? Are we? Because these are the things that are going to be coming back at us. Because as we point fingers at it, they're going to come and lash out against us as we're going to see even here in Scripture. Let's go to Genesis 37.3. I'm going to talk about Joseph. Now Israel, which is Jacob, loved Joseph more than all of his children because he was the son of his old age. He made him a distinctive long tunic with sleeves. But when his brother saw that their father loved Joseph more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not say peace and friendly greeting to him or speak peaceably to him. Now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. Why? Because he had something right there at that point in time that they didn't have. One, he had the garment. Garment from the, his father. What did that represent? That represented the love from the father, Jacob. And it was given to Joseph. Who's Joseph? Hello, Joseph. And the dreams. What are the dreams? And he went through a couple of different dreams, and they were the same principle of the dreams. It represented an authority. It represented an authority. And this is what we have over all darkness. 
We've got the love of the Father over all of darkness to conquer these things and to conquer everything that goes on the face of this earth. And we have got the authority through Jesus Christ to do it. We've been left with the name above all names. And it's time we use that authority and swing that sword that He has given us. Genesis 37.10 And He told it to His father as well and His brother, but His father rebuked Him and said unto Him, What's the meaning of this dream that you, should, that you have dreamed? And I... And your mother and your brothers actually shall we come down to bow ourselves to the earth and do homage unto you? Joseph's brothers envied him and were jealous of him. Again, the split between envy and jealousy. But his father observed the saying and pondered over it. Envy drove them to plot. And you will see over everything that we're going to talk about, or pre predominantly everything, they're always seems to be a plot when envy seems to arise. You saw it with Abraham. You saw it with Isaac. You saw it with Jacob within his family. You saw it with Joseph and his brothers. They, they schemed up a plot. A plot to do the things of what? Darkness? It drove them into the things of darkness. And all they had to do, the easy way that we can look at it, stand up to it, well, we are going to stand up to it, Ephraim. It is going to be driven out in this generation because it's still prevalent. So says the Scriptures. Now we're going to switch gears. We're going to flip over to 1 Samuel 18.6. And we're going to look at this through the eyes of Saul and David and what they were going through. Now you've got to realize at this point in time, Saul was a man, he was full of anxiety, paranoia, Depression. Didn't we read a lot of this stuff already? Talk about a lot of this? But Saul also needed to be praised because that's what was in him. He liked to be envied. And he needed to be the, what, the center of attention. Arrogant. He wanted to do things his way and only his way. Hated instruction of anything, including the Father, because he contradicted it over and over and over and went contrary to it. All the way to the point where he knew better to not to try to harm God's anointed. And what did he do? He still went after David multiple times. He still went after David multiple times. He didn't care at that point in time what God's word even said or what God had said or what God wanted. 1 Samuel 18, 6. As David and the others were returning from the slaughter of the Philistines, the women came out to all the cities of Israel to meet King Saul, singing and dancing in their briefs, singing and dancing joyfully with tambourines and three-stringed instruments. In their merrymaking, the women sang, Saul has killed his thousands, but David his ten thousands. So there's the envy right there. Because what did Saul want? Saul wanted the accolades. He wanted the accolades that David was getting. Let's continue on now. 1 Samuel 18.8 Saul came, became very angry because this song displeased him. He said, they give David credit for tens of thousands, but give me only credit for thousands. Now all he lacks is the kingdom. There's the jealousy. Because Saul had the kingdom at that point in time. It was getting turned over to David. And he was getting what? He was just holding on a little bit tighter. He was just holding on a little bit tighter because he was jealous about it. 1 Samuel 18, 9. From that day on, Saul viewed David with suspicion. Saul viewed David with suspicion. Where did we read that from? In 1 Timothy 6, 4. Right at the beginning. He is puffed up, puffed up with pride, stupefied with conceit, woefully ignorant, controversy, disputes, strife about words, which result and produce envy, Jealousy, quarrels, dissensions, abuse, insults, slander, and base suspicions. That's where the plotting comes in. And that plotting has always gone on. And it leads to disaster because it's not being led by Father, but be, the Father, but being led by man and man's manufactured way of escape. From that day on, Saul viewed David with suspicion. The following day, an evil spirit came from God powerfully over Saul, so that he fell into a frenzy in the house. David was there, playing his lair, and on the other, as on other occasions. This time Saul had a spear in his hand. 
And he threw the spear, thinking, I'll pin David to the wall. But David dodged out of the way twice. Twice? What do you think David did? Oh, here, Saul, you, you, you dropped this. Here you go, take another shot. He was enraged. He threw that spear, missed him, grabbed another one, threw it. He was enraged with David because of what David was about to get from the father, where it had shifted over from Saul over to David. And he envied God through that whole time. Saul became afraid of David because Adoniah was with him and had left Saul. And that's where Saul began to envy David. He began to envy David because God was with David and God was no longer with Saul. 1 Samuel 28, 15. And Samuel said to Saul, let's jump down to there. I'm going to show you. Envy. And Samuel said to Saul, it's only one verse. Why have you disturbed me to bring me up? Saul answered, I am bitterly distressed for the Philistines' sake. Uh, make war against me. And God has departed from me and answers me no more, either by prophet or by dreams. Therefore I have called you that you may make known to me what I should do. You look at this thing with envy, and where did envy drive Saul? Envy drove Saul to go consult into the demonic world. He concocted a plan to even get to that place to be able to talk to that spiritual medium to take him into the demonic world and access Samuel through it. Getting a little tricky? Wait till we get into the things of Jesus Christ. Let's go to Matthew 27, 9. I'm going to leave that one alone for now. Matthew 27, 9. One verse here. I'm going to kind of jump around all over the place for this one. Then were fulfilled the words were spoken by Jeremiah the prophet when he said, and they took 30 pieces of silver, the price of him on whom the price is, has been paid, set by the sons of Israel. And what's that? We're talking about a time and place. And we go back to Joseph here. 30 pieces of silver in Jesus' time was about the equivalent of 20 pieces of silver back in Joseph's time when Joseph was sold. When he was sold because of envy. And here we see envy coming up again, even with Jesus Christ himself. Matthew 27, 17. So when they had assembled for this purpose, Pilate, who said to them, Whom do you want me to set free for you? Barnabas or Jesus, who was called Christ? For he knew that it was because of envy that they handed him over. Because of envy that they handed him over. I told you it would get into the religious thing. And we can see how envy within the Sanhedrin drove them to put Jesus Christ on the cross and freed Barnabas. Or Barabbas, sorry. And free Barabbas. It was about envy. Matthew twenty-two eighteen. 18. Jump back a few chapters. But Jesus, aware of their malicious plot, again, they were always plotting against him. Their malicious plot, a plot of darkness. Why do you put me to the test and try to entrap me, you pretenders, you hypocrites? You see, that's what happens when you get into these evil plots against what God is trying to get done on the face of this earth. Let's jump over to Luke 22, too. One verse here. Luke 22, Two, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to do away with Jesus, for they feared the people. Again, the plot, envy and plotting, jealousy, strife, all goes in hand in hand. And one brings in another and brings another and brings another, and eventually it ends in destruction. It always has for individuals and for nations. Envy has taken down people, and envy has taken down nations. And that's why envy has got to be driven out of people, and envy has got to be driven out of nations in the end. Again, we're going to go through the scriptures on that one yet. 
but envy caused the Jews to plot. Plot against who? Plot against Jesus Christ. He was their brother. He was the king of the Jews, they said. And it's the same thing that Joseph went through with his brothers. It was envy that drove that. Both of them were sold. Both of them because of envy. Both of them had a plot against them. Both of them had things to do with dividing up Jesus' clothes and the cloaks and all these things that went on. There's such great parallel between the two scenarios and what happened there. But that's who we are. We are a partaker and we are of the house of Ephraim. We are of the house of Joseph. We have Jesus Christ. We wear the flesh of Jesus Christ around us. We have the testimony of, Je of, of God, of Jesus Christ, and we have the commandments and the covenants of the Father all one and the same. And when we put those things together, and we got both sides of our sword sharp, we can defeat anything individually. We can defeat anything as a nation. And we will, and we will drive it out from before us. You see, they envied his love. They envied the love of, of that the Father had with Jesus. Because he did one thing. He sacrificed his flesh while on the face of this earth through his walk. He sacrificed his flesh unto the Father while on the, sec on the face of this earth. And then he ended up sacrificing his flesh for us so that we could step into the other kingdom, so we could defeat into the other kingdom. We have access into the other kingdom. But he chose to stay sin-free so that he could do these things for us. What are we willing to sacrifice for him to be able to partake in the fruit that he has produced and that he has laid out for us to take part in? Are we willing to sacrifice? Are we willing to give up enough to be able to enter into that other kingdom to defeat and conquer because we all have the ability to do it. And we all have the ability to do it collectively. I had a picture in my head this morning, first thing when I woke up. Not a vision, I'm not going to get into that. But we were all standing there, and it was like we were, there's a line. And we were building a square building, and we each had a brick in our hand. And we walked up, and everybody was just to lay their brick on there, and then walk away and keep going. And every, by the time we got done, the building was built. Four walls. And then we all stepped back and we looked at it. And why is there envy throughout it? What, what is all this other stuff that's going on? If we are building a house, it has got to be out of purity. We've got to build it. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. The kingdom is built up there and we're trying to pull that perfection that God has up, up top and bring it down to the face of the earth within our lives so that when we lay our block on the foundation that God is trying to build as a nation and we erect these walls, it looks like the temple of the Almighty God. And until we can get that in our lives, we ain't building no temple. It's got to be done with purity. But they envied also the authority that Jesus Christ carried as well. Look at the miracles that were performed. Look at the things that went on. Because he had a balance to his walk. He went against, what? The envy that they had. Their man-made rules. We heard about that yesterday. Their man-made rules. And got down to exactly what God wants. But we have got the access. We have got the sacrifice. We have got what we need to sacrifice in front of us. It's just a matter of choice of what we're going to do. Are we going to give up? Give in? Many have. Great. But this is what it's about. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And just like what Joseph's brothers were going through, when Jesus was walking the face of the earth, they sure didn't want to hear about the dreams and stuff that was going on with Joseph. And they sure as heck didn't want to hear about what was going on with Jesus Christ and what he had to say in that day and that hour either. And guess what? The envy's going to come at you because people aren't going to want to hear what you've got to say either because it's going to go against the Sanhedrin that's out there right now who think that they make the rules and they're not making the rules of God and they're missing the whole transition that God is doing within this last transition. Envy will cause you to spiritually die because every time God has transitioned, people have been stuck in a certain place and wouldn't move. Envy will cause you and drive you to do certain things of darkness, but envy can also get you to stand still and do absolutely nothing. It's like the coffee shop, guys. 
It's where they go, the do-nothings go to do nothing. And if darkness can get you to sit still and do absolutely nothing, or if he can get you off track and go over here and do that, either way, he won. Because you're not doing the bidding of God. You're not staying in sync with God and where God is going for this end time. He's always and he's constantly moving forward. See, but envy and emulation, envy and emulation will also force people, force people and push people to try to push God's hand if we allow it into our lives. And that in itself will get us off track, will get us off track. That's something that we always have to be guarded against. These are things that we have to be aware of. Not delivered of, aware of. Look around, look for the purpose of temptation. Defeat it, beat it. Because what we have to do is we have got to hate sin. We've got to hate strife, malice, dissension, disorder. All these things we've got to hate. Because envy, strife, emulation of darkness, they are all products of darkness. And it is the root of all disorder that's gone on on the face of this earth. It's the root of it. Proverbs 14.30. Proverbs 14.30. A calm and undisturbed mind and a heart are the life and death of the body. But envy... Jealousy and wrath are like the rottenness of the bones. It's talking about death here. It's talking about physical death as happened in the Scriptures. It's talking about spiritual death here. It's talking about individual death. It's talking about corporate death. And it's talking about national death. You can apply it to all those different areas. Because it has always led from the very basics of our walk individually to the nations falling because of envy. And that's why we've got to come out of it. That's why we've got to be guarded about it coming at us. Romans 13, 12. Romans 13, 12 through 14. The night is far gone, and the day is almost here. Let us then drop, fling away the works and deeds of darkness, and put on the full armor of light. Why? It's a battle. Let us live and conduct our lives honorably and becoming as in the open light of day. Let us live and conduct ourselves honorably and becoming as in the open light of day and not reveling, carousing, and drunkenness, not in immorality and debauchery, sensuality and lasciviousness, not in quarreling and jealousy, but clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ the Messiah and make no provision for indulging in the flesh, Put a stop to thinking about the evil cravings of your physical nature to gratify itself and its desires to lust. You see, today, and where we're at, where, where we're at, envy is rampant on the face of the earth. Just look at what's going on around the world. It's all envy. It's all envy. I want what they have without any sacrifice to get it. I want what they have without any sacrifice to get it. And that's exactly what's going to happen. When the miracles increase in your life, when the demonstration of the healing powers of the Almighty God are prevalent and you're out there, people are going to have envy against you. The church is going to envy you. They're going to get into all this stuff. They're going to call it darkness. They're going to call it Satan. Envy. Envy, and it's happening. It's still on the face of the earth, and it will continue to be on the face of the earth. And that's what it's all about here, though, is taking what somebody else worked for. This is work. It's work to get to those points. It's work to produce the fruit. It's work to drive out those other spirits out of our life and not indulge in the flesh. It's work. It's sacrifice. But we've got to do the sacrifice in order to partake and the fruit that God has for us. And that's why we have got to be a doer of the word and not just a hearer. We have got to be a doer. And being a doer is not just, oh, I'm going to do it today, and then tomorrow I'll get lazy about it. It's about a consistent walk of doing and being astute to make sure that these things don't come back around again and keep them out once they're driven out. But we will 
as a nation, we will, as God's people, will be envied by the church because it's happened in every single transition. Whenever it went from, you could even look at the modern times, it went from, you know, the Baptist, the charismatic, and, and it went through there. Oh, that's not of God. That's not of God. And that's not of God. That's what they have always said. And here we are in the last transition, and it's going to happen once again. They're going to point a finger at us as we worship our God and say that it's not God. So let's do a run through some things that we've talked about. I've got a list of 11 things here. You don't have to write them all down, but you can go back to that page where I said, at the beginning, where I said, hey, let's uh, write it every other line. So we see it with Cain and Abel. I said that that was this two steps away, which means there's two things that happened before. Jacob fled from the, the face of his brother Esau. That was because of envy. Joseph, persecuted, went into bondage, his mock death, all because of what? Envy. Envy. Do you realize that Joseph went through a mock death and Jesus Christ, we've given a lot of parallels today, actually died? You want to see where things started? There's three or four major points right there that happened with Joseph that happened to Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ himself actually gave his life up. Gave his life up for us. And we turn around and we don't want to do this and get rid of these things and, and walk in this revelry. Oh, well, he's sitting there just waiting for people to partake in his flesh. It's going on around the world. We see that envy... At one point in time, it forced Moses to flee from, from Pharaoh even because of the things that went on with Moses and his brothers. Who made you king over us? Who made you guardian over us? Who made, who, who? Envy. Envy again, even with Moses back then. You see, you see with Aaron and Miriam, envy was there. They were out of the camp for seven days because of envy. Obviously, we went through with David. Not only was David hated by his enemies, which were out there, strangers that probably didn't even know him because of who he was in God. And I'm not talking about the people in his community or the people that were under him. There were nations that absolutely hated David because of the power that he had. But he also went through and was persecuted by Saul himself, all because of envy. We know that Jesus Christ himself was handed over because of envy. We look through and we can see where Jesus Christ raised up some guys. And what happened to them? Envy. They were all envied. They were all martyred. They all died a martyr's death at the end, except for, I think, one or two. It was all because of envy. Because the church didn't want to hear what they had to say. The church didn't want to hear what they had to say. And they ended up getting them in the end over envy. We look at the Apostle Paul. Paul was envied. Everybody was envying Paul. They hated Paul to the point where they beat him. They whipped him. Put him in jail, what, about seven times. Paul went through major persecution all because of envy. And here's the big one where I said we were starting on step two with Cain and Abel. Let's go back one step before. Envy has alienated the minds of women from their husbands and changed what was once said by even Adam himself. Now this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. But envy came in, and envy got in the middle of that, and envy separated that. You want to know why there's so much stuff going on out here today within marriages? A lot of it has to do with envy between the spouses. A lot of it has to do with envy between being a man and being a woman. Who cares? You are a child of the Almighty God. And that's all that matters. You have the same access into the other kingdom as any other gender. It's not gender related. It's about what are you willing to sacrifice in order to get to the other kingdom to pull it back. You have the power as a child of the Almighty God, and we all do. You see, in a word, envy and strife have overturned individuals. They've overturned Cities, they've taken and rooted out great nations off the face of the earth. And that's what envy has always done. Envy has always separated. Envy 
has so, so always separated, but it's by choice. It's by choice that we can choose not to. But you have to be on guard for what's coming. You have to be on guard for what's coming. Isaiah 11.10. We're going to wrap up with this set of Scriptures here. We're going to go 10 down to 13. 13. And it shall be in that day that the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal for the peoples of him. The root of Jesse. That was David's father, the lineage of Jesus Christ. We're talking about Jesus Christ. In that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal for the people of him. Shall the nations inquire and seek knowledge, and his dwelling shall be glory, his rest glorious. And in that day, the Lord shall again lift up his hand a second time to recover to acquire and deliver the remnant of his people which is left from Assyria and the lower Egypt and Pathros and from Ethiopia, from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamath. And this is, we're talking about Persia, we're talking about Babylonia, we're talking about Upper Syria. From the countries of bordering on the Mediterranean Sea. And he will rise up a signal for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and will gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. The envy and jealousy of Ephraim. Remember we were talking about building that house? And we looked at it and we said, well, why is there some, some bricks in there that say envy? And he will raise up and write a signal for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and will gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. And the envy and jealousy, separate again, of Ephraim also shall depart also shall depart. And they who vex and harass Judah from the outside or the inside shall be cut off. Both ways, both ways, from the outside or from the inside. From the inside doing it, or the attack from the outside. It's all aspects of envy and jealousy will be gone between us. The envy and jealousy of Ephraim also depart, and they who vex and harass Judah from the outside or the inside shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah. There it is. And Judah shall not vex and harass Ephraim. But look at the time when all this came in. It has everything to do with Messiah. There's more to this than what we know. And there's more things to drive out of our life on a daily basis as we line ourselves up to the perfect will of God for your individual life. And we've got to make this walk and we've got to make this relationship and we've got to make the Word of God personal within our lives. But envy has always plagued God's people. It has always gone right back and we went right back even in the Garden of Eden where man and woman were created and the two became one. She's bone of my bone. But where did it even start from there? Envy between God an envy of somebody who wanted to be above God. And it made its way down, and it's come all the way across, and it's still here, and here we are. We are going to finally defeat this thing. We are the generation upon whom this all falls. And you want to know why we're going through some stuff? Because we didn't know about envy. We didn't know about strife. We didn't know about the pain in order to be delivered of it in order to deliver this world, in order to defeat darkness at a level that's never been defeated throughout Scripture. We're going to do it. But you got to know about it. you got to know about it. We're going to stand up to it, and we are going to absolutely defeat it from the face of this earth. So thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's close in prayer. Father, we come before you. We thank you, Father. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you've given us. And we thank you for opening up your word and showing us, Father, what you have. Right now, Father, those who are struggling with, with envy, don't, don't get out of your chairs. These, these are things that you can, you can work on yourself. Father, give them the heart to be able to examine their lives over the next day, hour, week, whatever the time it is. Open it up so if there be any envy, Father, that they can get out and drive it out permanently out of their life, Father. Let us be astute to the envy coming towards us, Father, so that we can defeat it from both the inside and the outside. And right now we just ask you to bless your people. 
Bless your people as they go forth out into the world, as they fulfill the role that you have placed within their lives and you bring it forth, Father. Let them be enriched in it. Let them be enriched in you. Fulfill them, Father, with who you are. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen.